All right, welcome to the Top Rogue Podcast by Classic Roguecraft. I am your host, Snow, and this week we have Nether, the rogue class leader of Dream State, one of the top and longest running speedrunning guilds in the history of World of Warcraft. They set the number one speedrun clear for Molten Core during Phase 2, beating up progress by 48 seconds with a 22 minute, 21 second clear time. So in this interview, I talked to Nether about his thoughts on speedrunning, his history in speedrunning, how Dream State even became a speedrunning guild, as well as what tips he can give to other speedrunning guilds out there. We also talk about his rotations, his tips for general rogue strategy, and also we cover exposed armor because it's a hot topic right now. A lot of people want to know about exposed armor. And Nether's guild, Dream State, was actually one of the first guilds to adopt the exposed armor meta. And he was one of the proponents of really pushing that exposed armor to the forefront. As always, this content is brought to you by you guys. If you love my free rogue guides, there's even more guides and content available to Twitch subs. Once per week, I add an extra video guide for my Twitch subs covering heavily requested rogue topics in more detail. We've covered topics such as in-depth broodlord positioning, active trinket DPS calculations, and pet trinket raid tutorials. So if you want to help support Classic Roguecraft and get yourself bonus guides at the same time, head over to twitch.tv slash snowby and hit that subscribe button. You find all your bonus guides in the Twitch sub channel of the Classic Roguecraft Discord. And by the way, even if you aren't a Twitch sub, feel free to join our super active Discord linked in the description below. We have over 3,600 members currently and I'm in there all day answering questions and theory crafting with the other rogues. Let's just start off, like, uh, how long have you been playing WoW? Like, when did you get into all of this? I played WoW... I don't specifically remember which patch where I started, because, like, I'm 25 now. So, yeah. if you add it to the start of 2005, I wasn't exactly very old. And, uh, like, I have memories of doing PG, MC, and, like, first bosses in Black and Land, and so on. Back then, like... So I was just, I mean, completely raiding for fun. Yeah, and yeah, I understand that. I spend a lot of time, like, doing reputation, which is why I still have a thing for that. And then I was also, like, an explorer. So I climbed around in, like, all the weird parts of the world. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, like, no one, no later... one knew what they were doing back then, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I always yeah, tell people but... the story of how, like, I used to play Seal Fate Rogue without ACLG, and, and my guild just disenchanted them because we thought it was trash i mean on um, on emerald dream i was investigating glancing formula and back then we didn't really have any good add-ons for it so i went out found the original like glancing add-on that was made in if i remember correctly 1.9 and it was around that point where like people knew that it was there but one thing that people sent for to forget is that the combat log was like so bad early on yeah. like it had it had nothing so you could see that some of your hits did dealt less damage and people figured out that there was some sort of like penalty on it but it was quite late that people understood like the extents yeah. of like the formula and how much it actually impacts the gps yeah um, i remember like a elitist I, jerks was a thing back then you know, everyone's doing yeah. calculations and all that yeah yeah for sure um, but I suppose that was first around TPC when that started to get like popular. Uh, yeah. So, so have I you mean, been playing since like the very start of WoW then? Yeah. I mean, as I said, like I don't really recall, but I played before AQ launch, and then I played somewhat religiously until ICC ish in Wrath. Okay. And then I quit, and then around late 2012, I started on Emerald Dream. The so was Emerald like, Dream the first private server, or no? But it was the first like one X private server to reach more than one K or one point five K active players at the same time. So it was quite groundbreaking at that time. And okay. there was a lot of other servers like Rebirth, Vanilla Gaming, and so on. But a lot of those were old school private servers. 
So like there was also private service during CPC, but at that time it was private service where they had like upscaled everything. Everything was like intentionally completely bugged so you could solo Black Temple and so on. There was a guy called Sideways, I think it was, Sidespring, something like that, from Phoenix, who started a basically a passion project. I mean, this is where like term bliss like started to get a lot of wind and people started to create a more like actual vanilla experience and it was like for what we have right now it was fucking horrible <laughs> uh, like when it released it was down for a week and uh, if you go back and check like our first speed runs i don't know 52 48 minutes or something like that the server crashes twice during it <laughs> and okay. i mean that was what it was like the server crashed a lot and everything was scuffed but you could still feel that there was like passionate like developers behind it and that was when yeah as i said it, it started to get quite popular and um yeah i think may 2013 that was when they released black one lair and we couldn't kill the farian because the i mean i've always played horde the totems on the farian they spawned on the ground and they take the for 60k <laughs> uh, healing on the Farron, so you couldn't kill him for the first, yeah. So okay. in that sense, it was very Bliss-like. I mean, content was released without being killable and so on. Uh, and then we had Black One Lair for one and a half year, I think, and without like any info any about content. AQ. Oh, okay. And that was why we started speedrunning, uh, because we, I mean... Okay, yeah, that, that makes a sense guild, then, yeah. Because you, you have nothing to do a, for like a year and a half. Yeah, then. exactly. And as a guild, we, we had a lot of trouble because, I mean, now, I mean, right now people are in what some call like the AQ drought when there's not much content and people are like starting to burn out this summer and some of the call raiders are quitting. And that was like nothing compared to what we had on yeah. like Emerald yeah. Dream because back then we were basically forced to recruit anyone who was interested in joining. And we had times where we just raided as like 36 because that was what we had. And it was like... I mean, yeah, it peaked, I think, at 2.5k, but that was at its peak. And then it just went down and down. So we were sitting at, like, concurrent, I don't know, 900 players or something like that. And uh, that meant that we had to create some sort of content for our raiders that was new. Um, yeah, just to keep them entertained. A, yeah, exactly. And we had a guy in the guild called Dilatsatsu who made a, like, baby version of Warcraft Lux. Uh, we could upload like our combat log and so on, but it was nothing in comparison to Warcraft logs. But we could like upload the the like damage meters, the total raid time, and when we did that, then that was when like we started having a competition with uh, like the best alliance guild, which was Team Plague at the time, to see who could clear like basically every instance the fast. So we both did Molten Core speedruns and Black and Last speedruns and uh, CG speedrun. Um, CG, damn. Yeah. So because of the constant rod, we were basically just speedrunning everything. And then it took cycles. So we made a record and then we proceeded to, for instance, Molten Core, which the other guild had. Then we tried to get a record there. And then the other guild beat us in Black Moulin, and then so on and so forth. It continued. And it's that was when the like speedrunning yes. meta came to be reminds me a lot of uh i don't know if you ever played everquest or anything like that but uh it reminds me a lot of the everquest meta on on the early metas where it's, it's literally just like a couple guilds really pushing each other to get mm. better and better because yeah, they, yeah. they have nothing else to do like um like i said i i come from an mmo background where i played everquest and and all of that before and yeah like you said once you get i, I think what do you think the mark is where you think the burnout starts really setting in for no new content because uh for me on everquest i always found it was around like if if it goes for more than three to four months that's when people really start running out of stuff to do mm. i mean i think it depends a lot on what you're used to and like how satisfied you are in general with what's in it i mean we've seen it many times on private service that there is something around like pre-aq where people have like basically gotten the biz they've gotten the alt they want to get up they've ranked if they want to do that and then you're basically i mean you don't have achievements um you have no further uh, like interest in pvping because you've gotten as far as you wanted or could go and then there's basically nothing left and i mean on private service we also had the problem that as soon as next released 
then we were done. I mean, there was no TBC on the horizon and that was it basically. And so is that what didn't... tends to like kill the private servers eventually? Like just no new content? Yeah, I would say so. And like, on the, I mean, on the private servers, we also always had like the problem of like the fear of losing your character. So the fresh train got a lot more attention in general because it was just like getting fast up to 60 and then ranked and then stopping again, basically. Um, and uh, then, okay. yeah. yeah, then it's all kind of pointless once Snacks is out because, I mean, you've yeah, cause you reached beat the game. The yeah, there's nothing else yet. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, I, I guess I'll, let, let's let's go back to the, the start of this a little bit. And like, why why did you pick Rogue as your class to begin with? Uh, I had played Druid in, from like vanilla to TBC, then I did some P, and then I had a Twink Mage that I had like as a... 29 twink, 39 twink, 49 twink, and then eventually I took it to 70. And then I had that as my main until the end of Wrath when I quit. And then when I started on private servers, I wanted something entirely different, um, which was, yeah, then a melee DPS. And then it was kind of like, yeah, warrior or rogue. And rogue was the one I knew the least about. So that's why I picked rogue. And then I've been playing rogue, yeah, for the past eight years, I guess. <laughs> So I guess you just really like Rogue then? Yeah. I mean, I do like the class a lot, but to a certain extent, I've lost the interest like in the game. And then for me, it's been about my guild. And that's what like keeps me that interested. Motivate. Basically, okay, because, I see. Yeah. So Because it is like a really big community and we have existed for so long. And we are like, as far as I know, also the longest standing like hardcore guild. Uh, which have started back then. I mean, there's also kills like apes and so on, but they had like different leaderships and also different names and so on. But you could also argue that they are up there okay. for sure. Yeah. So I, I mean, here's a question: Why did you pick Horde? Because, uh, and and why do you? How, how big do you think the disadvantage is by being Horde? Because obviously you don't have paladins, which is really massive now in the speedrun thing. Yeah. Um. I mean, it it depends on the context. Uh. And you certainly, I mean, I've looked at, like, I've I've spent a lot of time on speedruns and developing speedrun strats and looking into, like, the more, like, nitty-gritty information and differences that can be between. And I don't have that much practical experience, like, speedrunning on Alliance, but I've braided there for a bit. And I think the main difference in, like, the feel, of course, there's, like, an individual difference. So, for instance, the timing of your sinisters is a lot more important on horde and it's at least in my opinion it's so it has so little impact on alliance that you should be more focused on just spamming your rotation and then just keeping like the most optimal rotation that you can spamming your spenders sorry okay. yeah yeah. Um, so, yeah so just swing timing basically yeah and then there's also like the greater like thing difference of yeah, sure. There are some sheets which put a slight lead on Horde for like Wind Fury being better than the stats that they have. But when it comes to speedruns, mm, you don't. That doesn't really make any difference at all because if you look at Horde speedruns and you, for instance, go on encounters, check like the top like peak rate DPS of like top ten or top twenty speedrunning guilds, then you see that they peak around the same point. Port does get a tiny bit ahead, but in the first four seconds of each encounter, the alliance ramp up much, much faster than Port deals. And it's almost only that ramp up time that makes the difference. And the only thing that can be attributed to is salvation. But if you have like Thunder Fury and a tank pumping with like rank gear, whatever, then it is typically fine um, with like that ramp up time. And then the only thing you have aside from that is added survivability from uh, kings. And of course, like off target over aggros and so on. Like, I mean, for instance, in uh, one of our first MC speedruns on Classic, we had a fury over aggro on a destroyer, like the two destroyers that are up for Gar. Yeah. And we went in and checked the logs and he wasn't even nuking, like he over aggroed the off target like cross and we were nuking skull and we went in and checked the log and it was just like from the tank it was just like a 
like he got some orders in, but his like heroic strike parried and so on. And then the Fury who over aggroed, it was a non crit whirlwind hit that made him get aggro and then he died. Uh, and for instance, if he had salvation in that case, then he wouldn't would have, have died. Happened. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, and like off target over aggros is also dealing with on like, for instance, worm guards, so on. And uh, I mean, everyone has seen like the horde guilds just get like completely stomped by spinners, for instance. Yeah. And yeah. that's mostly due to salvation as well, because like a spinner is in itself on the tank, they have proper positioning, it's not dangerous because you won't really be hit by it. But horde guilds, they try to blast and have a fury over aggro who's standing on top of the melee and then he starts spinning and then he's just hitting all of the melee and that's when it gets like extremely dangerous um and then in my opinion there's the thing that's overlooked the most in terms of like differences between the factions and that's raid composition and if you look at mc speedruns for instance uh you want to say like okay we have as a minimum seven melee groups that uh, underline seven shamans and then you need to have a druid. And yeah, the druid can be in different specs and so on, but that doesn't really matter that much. Like, point being is that everyone needs to have a druid because of verify, obviously. Yeah. And then you have eight healers. And then you're like, okay, it's an MC speed run. We don't want 12 healers. We want to be around like 10. Most people are using around 10. And that means that you have two priests. And if you get a, for instance, core hound that puts a debuff on the raid that you need to dispel then if your two priests need to dispel 40 people that's divided by two so in effect that's 20 globals which is 30 seconds so if you have a bad debuff on a core hound your priest will if they are like robots they will be unable to heal for the next 30 seconds and yeah then there's some more like practical differences they can dispel the most important people first and then heal a bit in between when you're not killing anything and so on but um it's still globals that needs filled and if you are running a as an alliance guild you can have a lot more than two typically you're running like four or five and that nullifies the like this spell time like obviously not entirely but at least to an extent where it doesn't make as much as a, like a difference and then on top of that you can also have the healers uh, like the priests do pray of healing which the horde guilds don't really have access to uh, again because of the raid composition yeah okay so um, i mean so th those are the main things uh, and w you, you briefly talked about um like uh, the, the differences as far as uh, the speed running, but uh, what are your thoughts as far as um, the line between, like you, you talked about the spinners. What, what are your thoughts as far as the line between smart use of game mechanics and exploit? Because uh, especially now, right now, it, it came about that there's that whole Blade of Eternal Darkness and Mind Vision strategy. And then some yeah. people are also using flasking and then d d different things on different levels, I feel. Where, where do you feel the line is for you as far as what you would consider like just straight up exploiting and what you would consider okay to, to do? I mean, I mean, it's it's a pretty good example to talk about what Dream State has done in the past. Um, because when it comes to my own opinion and like doing speedruns in general, uh, I think the crux of the issue is simply that it doesn't matter what the individual wants. What matters is like the broad community. And it's primarily, of course, the people who are speedrunning themselves, but it's uh, it's also like the actual broad community. So like everyone who's interested in speedrunning, um, simply because speedrunning has more value, the broader uh, of a community that it entails and has like draws interest from. And on like NOS uh, slash anathema um we started using invis pots to skip uh, trash and that like we got a record and but i mean we wouldn't have gotten a record without the invis pots and it was like memed really heavily and okay, so, so like, what, I what was the strategy for that again can you explain basically i mean basically it was just, i mean we actually tested a shit ton of stuff and we prepared a lot more for doing the invis skips than you did for like normal runs but the general like speed run bar was also much much lower back then uh, but basically we went on like we tested we had like a cleared instance okay. and then we tested uh, like pull ranges beforehand then we tested like running from specific points with certain amount of movement speed and try to see like okay how far can you 
extend like 18 second duration. Um, the problem with that is that you're turning like the instance or like the concept of speedrunning from clearing an instance to like just killing the last boss as fast as possible. Um, and at that time, we also had like done some test theorized like the possibility of just skipping as many bosses as possible simply because that people don't really talk about it but there are optional bosses in black and Lair. and uh, yeah okay yeah so um... so yeah so what it comes back to is just that i mean speedrunning will always be like on the edge sometimes beyond the edge of what's considered to be all right and the jury's always going to be out on that and we'll just have to take it like exploit by exploit basically <laughs> uh, i think for a lot of people the difference i mean we saw ourselves that it's way more interesting fun not to do those in in the skips and uh, i think for a lot of people it does include like killing most of like the entities inside the and i do think that's most fair because it also like sets the guild more apart because I mean, any guild can kill Ebon Rock fast by stacking, like, yeah, warriors, stacking, yeah, yeah, so 25 on, but, melee or something. But, but where it really separates people is how you handle everything that's in between. And, um, I mean, the classic is that, for instance, in Molten Core, there was a lot of guilds who had, like, a really fast Gar time. But then the time from, from like, Gar to killing Sulfron, that was when, re like, you really see the difference between the guilds. Um, simply because of like the lava packs and how you held or like dealt with the lava packs that was what made the difference okay well, whether I mean, you got like a top 40 or top 10 okay i mean that, that kind of goes into my next question then is is uh is, is that what you would consider the most important thing as far as as, as someone getting into speed running is just optimization on trash basically that was what made the difference for us in when we got like the world record in molten core in like t1 before the the lock um i went in and i checked like the second guild at the time or like the guild that we were competing with that was progress um and on like encounters and like just on the trash mobs themselves they had 31 percent more damage than us um, and if it's only down to how fast you can kill rag or whatever we would never have like any remote chance to kill them or to beat them uh, or like the alliance as a whole because the, they have like way more rankers than us they also play on alliance and then what we had to look at is then okay how can we optimize the actual route for like running from point a to b how can we do that in the most straight line possible uh, without like zigzagging in between so we laid out a map where like I talked a lot with our pull hunter and then we were like, okay, when we reach this point, that's when you have to pull that mob. So when we get like 10 yards further up, we'll reach it because if it's not pulled at that point, then it means that the melee needs to run further to the right to kill it and then go back. Um, and yeah, that made a really big difference in our time. And that was why we were able to get ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, that, it's that's... less so important in black on lab because there's much less, um, much movement less, yeah, and much those options out of the total like 20 and a half million damage that you need to deal during a black on last speed run 10 million of that is on encounter and i mean yeah you it it like sort of plays into trash in the sense that if you have trash deaths you will have delay on trash and then later you'll have slower a uh, boss dps most notably on ebon rock flame gork ragus and farion which total is like uh, six and a half, seven million, something like that, which is like almost all of the damage done um, to encounters. So, yeah, it's like it's not so important in Black on Lair because there's not as much movement and you spend more time on bosses, but it is extremely important in Molten Core because it's a much longer it's more trash. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, the, the raid yeah, encounters for people trash. that don't know, the raid encounters actually changed a lot because uh, Molten Core was made by one of the OG EverQuest hardcore guys that, that was all about big instances with a bazillion trash. And then Blackwing Lair, they actually changed it because people complained there was too much trash. So, yeah, that's why. But yeah, I mean, right now there's also like a really strong emphasis on like skipping trash. You didn't do that back then. Or you did some of it, of course, but like even the fucking like the first skip where you go to the right. Yeah. Everyone does that nowadays. People didn't do that back, back then. 
in like early vanilla and yeah later on some guilds started doing it but it was first later that it was like highly materialized the meta of like see my hardcore and also casual guilds um yeah everyone's doing and that. i mean nowadays people also do the the lava skip after magma die. Uh, oh yeah yeah my guild so, does it well yeah everyone does that yeah and like people even didn't even do that on private service that was i mean we did it i think just a couple of times uh, recently before classic but outside of that it like people really didn't do it and it is first here on classic that it has become like yeah once again fully yeah. materialized so i, I mean the next, next question i want to ask is i guess how do you practice like do you go into empty instances or like i know some guilds sometimes they even have private servers that they go on and do stuff on yeah i mean we've never been much for private service in uh, dream state and like the biggest difference is that people have lacked like proper instances or like private service where you could practice it so that it was different. And we found that like for us on actual private service, we always ran like actual split rates where we had, we had a roster of like 60 people then divided by two into 30 and then you had 10 old. And we have gone away from that on classic where we have like two full rosters of equal strength. And then in the farm rates, then we push the time to get that down. And I think that has made like a much larger impact for us. So we aren't speed running like weekly in the sense that like we don't really flask, like casters flask, and we don't really go so fast that the healers can't drink. Um, and then of course, like sometimes, I mean, in farm rates, we joke around quite a lot and so on, but uh, we could really see that like for instance, in Molten Core, like early on when people were doing like 40 minute farm rates, we were trying to push that down to 35. Then we did a speed run and then we could get it down towards 33 and 32 because every time we had a speed run, we started perceiving the instance differently and started getting better at some of the things that we have been practicing. Um, okay, so, so I think it, it depends a lot on what your goals are and where you want to go. Uh, what I've done personally when I've made the strats is that I've like, first of all, watched a shit ton of speedruns and then i have like a split sheet where i go in and then i take like okay how long does it take for this guild to get from that point to that point and then i compare it across a lot of different guilds and then i see like okay there's this guild who has done it in like 47 seconds when there's most other guilds do it in a minute what are they doing differently and once you do that you start getting like a perception of what takes time in a speedrun interesting and so, so you're, you're picking when you, the, like the best bits from other people as well yeah of course i mean we we try to come up with strats but i mean i would be lying if i were saying that we weren't taking ideas from other people and that's what everyone is doing and that's also what's nice about speedrunning is that it's yeah it's about like individual guilds but it's also about like the broad community and see how far they can push it like for instance they're like i mean we saw it most recently with the guilds who um figure it out like we call it the worm guard delay where you pull the oh. three worm guards aside and then kill them in nef phase one and there was obviously some guilds who were faster to figure that out than others but nowadays most people are doing that yeah um do you know who was the first one to start doing that i know the first guild who public with it was calamity who uh, streamed it a couple of days before most of the other guilds who did it because they raided on a sunday if i remember correctly uh, we had done it on like locked locks, uh, like one or two, one and a half or two months before that. And when I came, like I was the one who came up with strat in our guild, I hadn't taken uh, inspiration from like another guild at that point because, yeah. uh, I mean, we weren't public with it, and the other guilds uh, were doing it weren't public with it either. I can't say for sure that we were the first to do it, but. Uh, I didn't, at least for that thing, I didn't take inspiration from anyone else. Okay. But that, like, for all that I know, Calamity might have been doing it a couple of weeks before. And, yeah, because yeah, obviously uh, they don't publicize what, what the secret strats are yet. Yeah, that's the thing. And then it's, I mean, it is sort of pointless to discuss who did it first because it's like, then you need to prove it and people don't really want to prove it in the start and yeah, yeah so on. So, okay. yeah. So, I mean, I mean so let, let's shift a little bit here to um, what do you... Uh, you're, you're kind of famous for your stamina and survivability focus. Um, why do you yeah. believe that 
uh, stamina and such of that to the extent where I, I think was it you that you even enchant stamina on your braces over strength? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what is the thought process behind all of that exactly? The majority of all of this uh, relies on the fact that I play hold. It's much more like like I quite often tank like for, like for instance in our farm rates. I often end up getting aggro on Razor Core. And when I do, I just evasion. And with the gear that I have right now, I'm mitigation capped with evasion. And that virtually means that I'm like immortal. And then I don't have to waste waste a vanish cooldown on it. And it also makes it a lot more safe for the healers because if you have like five rogues who end up getting aggro and then they vanish and another guy gets aggro, it's get it gets a lot harder for the healers because like, oh, they see like, oh, it's no longer tank who has aggro. I'm going to start healing nether. Then nether vanishes, another rogue gets aggro and then he starts getting hit and then they try to swap over. Or like So it's just like, it's much better to just keep it on one target. And if the target is immortal, then it's perfect, right? Uh, but okay. like... The philosophy that I have when it comes to stuff like that is that when it comes to items, enchants, buffs, and whatever, what I view to be the goal is the like DPS that you can produce, like the average DPS that you can produce over like 50 ID. And that of course means that it risks or like that it uh, minimizes the focus on peak DPS. Uh, so like I'm not much of a parser myself and I don't believe in like I don't find passing like actual passing that interesting um, and for me it's like okay so if you take risk for instance say okay I have a chance to get nine or like ten and a half or whatever it makes out to be with C and or kings how much AP is that okay so it's ten and a half AP how much DPS do, does that give over the course of the entire instance that's let's just say that it's like five then you say okay what is the probability of you surviving i don't know shadow flame tanking a spellbinder tanking a worm guard with like that sliver of health and if you do and get to keep all of your world buffs how much dps will you then have after that point and then i'm like okay so like it's it's hard to give like actual math or something like this but if you say that it's like one in a hundred or one in a thousand you to survive with that then first you save time on the raid not having to wait if you are about to engage a global combat so you have to be rest you get rest and then you get uh, rebuffed and then you start dpsing again most notably without your world buffs and if you are fully world buffed it's like i don't know 55 percent of your total dps and then there's of course also consumables top and so on like yeah. I don't usually pop my 2% hit chocolate if I die, uh, simply because I farmed enough for a year, and that means that I, I can't reapply it when I die because then I won't have enough in the end. Okay, yeah. So um, then I guess, w would you say that uh, this is mostly just a horde thing then? If you were Lance, would you not uh, have as much stamina focus? Mm, no, I wouldn't, simply because you're much less likely to get aggro from stuff. And uh, then you also have the extra stamina from kings. And then there's also like, I mean, it's an internal discussion, but at least on my server, I think I would have, I would have been a lot more likely to go very high rank with the brackets that the Alliance had. Um, and I, like, I, I was physically unable to go like 14 on my server with the brackets with that we had early on brackets. where people were playing <laughs> the, like, yeah, the AV, the AV meta was pretty cancer. Yeah, and like 20, 30 minutes queues. And like we had a guy in our guild who went 13 and he like slept between the queues and yeah. played like 100, 142 hours in a week out of what is it, 152, 59, something like that. Um, yeah, that was pretty and, bad. Yeah. 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 Okay. So like it, it goes into this border thing. And then there's, of course, like the fact that for rogues, the tier two wrists are really good for PvP as well. And uh, that's what I would be using in like large scale PVP and also like smaller scale battleground PVP and also 1v1s. And then you also have the like same wrists there. And I only have one pair and we still have two rogues out of like 12 who are missing the two, two wrists. So we don't really have a second pair for a second challenge yet. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. so that's like the, the one thing where I have made like the more controversial decision to like opt for survivability. Uh, but my main focus has always been to hit like the level where you are mitigation capped with evasion active because 
what it does for me is that when I get aggro, I turn like the boss or the mob and then I just evade because that gives me effectively a secondary vanish cooldown. So the next time I get in trouble, I can just vanish. And if I don't use the evasion as a vanish, that means that the next time within the like three and a half or five minutes that I might over aggro, then I'm most likely dead. And then having that vanish in that case means that I can survive. Um, so it is like, yeah, I sort of perceive farm rates to be speedruns as well. Like I don't go for passing and I have a really strong emphasis on like overall like rate well-being in the sense that I try to play in a sense where like I don't want to risk dying, of course, because of my buffs and so on. But it's also that dying means that a healer down the rate. has like yeah. 10 seconds where they can't yeah. drink or mana walk and yeah, so on. Okay. Um, and then it's just like playing with, I mean, I actually got DFT last reset. So like in PVE spec right now, I have 36% dodge and 6% parry. And then you have the five miss on top or yeah. Okay, and so then I'll... there's of course like all the consumables and so on. And that ends up being, I think 56% I have in um, your rate, like fully rate set up. Yeah. 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 So I, I mean, that goes to another question I have. How do you feel about uh, Dark Mental? The fact that you actually lose a bunch of survivability if you swap over the dark mental at the start of phase five? Uh, the trade for me is that I'm going to start flasking every reset in AQ. And I've been thinking about it for a bit. And I think to a certain extent, it's more important for melees or these rogues specifically to flask in AQ than next. Um, simply because it's a lot more like bike damage that you'll take in AQ. And you also handle the trash packs in a sense where you're much more likely to get aggro. Um, so yeah, I'll be opting for Dark Mantle, but I'll still be using like stamina wrist enchant, and I will be flasking. Ah, okay. And yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, let's uh, let's 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 shift gears a little bit here. Um, so I have some exposed armor questions because that's been the kind of big thing lately. Everyone suddenly started talking about improved exposed armor, and as far as I know, you guys were one of the early adopters of that whole improved exposed armor meta. So um, can you say like how how did this come about? Like how did you even like start doing this? Is this a private server thing or like wh where did this all come I, from? I mean, it. My focus on boss armor, uh, once again, was from Emerald Dream. Uh, back then, we were playing on 4.7k armor, and as you probably know, that's like, I don't know, 30% less physical damage or like 25 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and we were looking to options where we could reduce that amount. And back then, people didn't, like, I didn't think of post armor back then, and our tanks were also like, almost full tier two and like one hand and shield because the bosses hit like much harder they were like buffed uh, so people weren't like fury tanking the same way that we are today and then we started looking to options where you could do that otherwise and that was with annihilator and at the start like there was back then we i mean we found the patch notes where i think it's like is it in 1.9 where fairy fire no longer stacks with a uh, ribbon spike um i don't okay, actually I recall can't but the exact one yeah and then now the proc is really bad like the proc rate yeah and here it's really bad and here it is like 3.7 um and like the, the problem we had back then on emerald dream was that there wasn't any like deep off priority so something like annihilator could be pushed off by a lot of shit um and that was why we ended up not doing it um but then we came to Classic, uh, which of course is the more interesting part. And um, I knew that Annihilator was shit. And then basically the only thing that's left, I mean, there's also some minor items besides that, but like the most like accessible armor reduction that you can get is Bose Armor. And we use that leading up to our first MC speedruns, which I mean, we did in total three MC speedruns before the lock. And yeah, so that's around November or something like that. And then, yes, yeah, as far as I know, um, like no other guilds were doing it at that point. And um, yeah, I mean, we basically just used it because it's only like accessible point because like the bosses died too fast in like both Black Moonlight now, but also yeah. most notably in MC back then for Annihilator to work. And what we did on private servers was that we had uh, like a group of 
10 warriors or something like that who did like the first three hits with annihilator and then three people or two people or like depending on the encounter one to three people would keep on using it and that would have like two benefits one you would get more procs at the start and two the warriors uh, would have like worse weapons so they could start their normal rotation faster and not worry as much about threat yeah. um um did you worry about the the threat because it's interesting that you were one of the first to do expose ammo but your horde guild where threat is already less than alliance that does does that factor in at all the threat issue uh yeah i mean it it was very controversial and when i did it and like preached for it in like the rogue discord and other discords people were always like yeah my tanks don't want to do it because of like threat and they're saying it will be too bad and so on um but like we basically just opted like i i in my guild i pushed for it to the extent where i just said like okay we will use expose armor on these and then we gave it like a couple of months for the tanks to adapt and it worked out being fine because like the like i don't think that the threat after like five or ten seconds on encounter is too bad like at least for us right now like on the farian if you look like 40 seconds into the fight the tank is fucking 30 percent above number two so like the the average tps is like more than fine for horde but the problem is just in those like first five seconds before the threat gets stabilized and it's very prone to like bikes and rng and during that time they still have sunder still armor sunder. okay so i mean i guess the, um, the general strat for people who don't know is is your tank still you still get the sunders in up, up at the start and then you overwrite that with improved exposed armor after correct yeah yeah and you still want to do that because you can't get the exposed armor up instantly um and it works out perfectly because they have the Sunder Armor at the start, but uh, then the, the Exposed Armor will apply later on. And But it's also like pure damage modifiers are like absolutely insane for TPS, like Darkmoon Fair and like Armor Reduction and so on. So right now, if you have like a Blackmoon Lab, this fully well buffed, fully well buffed, this tank, Sunder Armor is actually at the point where it's at the very least threat neutral with like normal rotation or not using it. And in some cases, it's actually threat negative. Um, and that's why at the point that we are in right now, that I don't really think, at least for the hardcore kills, which are this fully well buffed, that it is any concern because they are much more interested in just pumping pure damage. And that's, yeah, Sunder Armor can proc Wind Fury for horde guilds. But outside of that, Sunder Armor is basically just like a flat threat modifier that you apply to your target. And once you have like really high strength and agility on your tank with like fully well buffed, then you get much more out of the damage itself. And that just comes from the fact that like the way that people are using Fury tanks right now, uh, the largest, or I don't, I don't actually know if it is largest portion, but at least comparatively, it is a much larger portion now that comes from like pure damage. Uh, whereas it, like previously, both in vanilla and on private servers, we relied much much more on like threat threat modifiers from heroic strike, uh, sunder armor, yeah. uh, shield okay. slam. So, so I, I guess the main thing is you're saying is basically that uh this the this improved exposed armor doesn't really hurt the threat that badly because most of the threat is still coming through at the start with the sunders and and all that. Yeah, and and then there is also a breakpoint where tanks don't want to use sunder armor like okay. at all. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I mean, I, I sent you some um, numbers. So this is from from Simon in the Rogue Discord. He did some really rough math on, on the Sunder Armors. Do your numbers match up to, to what I sent you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward in the sense that you have like physical damage done and then you increase it by a certain percentage and then you'll see that increase. And I mean, right now, most people are... Or, most hardcore kills are running like five melee groups and that typically gives you like four times four plus three melee dps if you include tanks and then you also have hunters on top and so on and i mean okay. warriors are basically only doing physical and then rogues have like a tiny bit instant poison on top okay um, so i, I mean the, the only thing that was really we weren't really sure on it with the numbers there is um what, what are you finding the dps losses for that one rogue that has to be the the exposed armor rogue it is a bit more in practice than the sheet uh, would suggest. Uh, I mean, you can go back and look at both our and other speedruns, uh, like our rogues and the rogues in 
other kills in their speedruns that the rogue who's doing exposed armor is typically sitting like a bit further down and that's just because of, like the encounters that we have they are so short so the like the portion of your damage that comes from first of all an optimal rotation and second of all eviscerate is much larger so the exposed armor rogue he will have points where he's forced to like drop the slice maybe for a couple of sec and of course opt out of the yeah. um eviscerate uh, damage do you know how much dps loss it is like roughly as, as far as a number uh, i mean i can go back and check some of our uh because uh, we, we, we estimated it's like 80 to 120 does that sound like about right or would you say it's a bit more yeah i mean if you if you have a baseline of like a normal combat broke who's doing around 1 to 1.2k um then it's probably around there okay um i mean it's it's always hard to say because you don't exactly know like how much the rogue would do otherwise yeah and so... then you're typically comparing him to like the best the best yeah um, exactly. So the, the I, other best rogues in the I raid. Mean, I mean, the the question here is um um which which version of exposed armor do you guys run? Because I've seen a lot of guilds use a lot of different talent builds. So there's like the standard combat build, yeah. improve exposed armor. There's hemo exposed armor. There's uh, um, seal fade exposed armor. Which one are you guys running? Yeah. and Why? Uh, the main thing. I mean, the the main thing that cocks like the hemo and seal fade rogues are the accessibility to weapon skill from the lack of weapon expertise um what i mean i'm rogue seal in my guild and what i just said is that i want expose armor and then however he applies it is up to him both because i don't want like i don't want to shoehorn one of my rogues to a, like a spec that he doesn't find fun and like isn't interested in playing long term because some might consider expose armor not to be that fun to yeah. do or apply in general and then being combat might be like the perfect middle ground for them where they can be like okay i can play like a normal rogue i have or like somewhat i have my adrenaline rush i'm not cocked on weapon skill and then i can just apply exposed armor every now and then and then that's it okay so interesting uh, so you haven't gone like the full min max route on exposed armor where you you optimize that one rogue just to sacrifice everything to get it up as soon as possible not in farm rates uh, and i don't think we'll ever do that in farm rates uh, simply because it's like yeah i mean i just tell the rogues that i want to be exposed like you are applying exposed and then however you want to go about that is is up to you the lack of weapon skill is obviously like a really big thing if you want to go for Seal Fade or Hemo. Um, and that gives you like some problems if you are Horde Guild or like an Alliance Guild without access to humans. Uh, because if you have like a human rogue with, for instance, a Maladab. Okay. So, so you would say like, yeah, maybe the human rogue has more options as far as like optimal, optimal um, improved exposed armor builds. Yeah, for sure. Because if you want to be a horde with like 305 or 10, uh, then you have to go for daggers. And daggers can be pretty good. And like, yeah, there are some breakpoints between daggers and swords where they are best depending on which like con uh, consumables, uh, trinkets they have available, like Thistle and Venataki. Um, so it, it like it sort of depends. There are a breakpoint where something like a Hemo or Sylphate can be better. Um, but, but I don't think overall, you, like you, you the, don't force it as much. I, I wouldn't force it directly. Uh, we are gonna like investigate it a lot more in AQ with for instance like double maces uh, or uh, just daggers in general because of like death's thing. Um, but uh, I mean, of course, in general, swords will be the better option for it. But I don't think that there's a case where one option is like much more like important to have or much more like okay so you don't in, feel like the much, difference is much like... better in the sense that it's yeah. mandatory to have one version better than the other and the most important thing is that you have one rogue doing exposed armor um because like i just found a log for you uh this is in one of our speed run on nefarian okay and you can see most of the rogues are doing like one to one point almost 3k and then the rogue called basara who's doing 966 yeah he's the one who's supplying exposed armor Okay, yeah, so he got hit like a decent chunk there, but... Yeah, but like, if you compare it to like, the worst other rogue, then it's only a different yeah, it's, 35, it's, it's 40. It's only a little bit lower, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so fair yeah. enough. Um, so I, I guess the one question I do want to, I'm curious about is, how do you feel about Badge of the Swarm Guard coming up? Because that's kind of related to that. Does that is that going to impact things? 
Uh, I mean, it is a really nice trash trinket. Uh, and I think it does have like an insane value in trash. But people typically don't care about trash because it's not locked. Uh, but as we were talking about before with MC speed running and so on, like how you handle trash and how fast you do trash is sometimes a determining factor in how fast you do your run. Okay. Um, but I don't think Batch of the Swamp God will get much hype simply because it's not a very good boss trinket. Okay. Uh, and I assume it's not good boss trinket because the boss is already at like no armor, basically. Yeah, it has like yeah. 36 left. So unless we find like another. So, so would would you say run, it, it's more viable if if you're in a guild that doesn't improve exposed armor then and, and then you use it on the boss fight? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Sure. Okay. I mean, if you can open up with that, get some stacks so you can start your like full burst CD uh, faster than the others, uh, then uh, yeah, it will, yeah, it will have a lot more value. Do you think it is more viable on a rogue or, or a warrior who can cleave the trash? Because that's another thing I was wondering about. Um, in general, warriors scale a lot better from like percent scalers and yeah. like the armor reduction because they get extra rage from like hitting harder. And I mean, that's also just why warriors end up coming ahead of rogues because they scale better with everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, warriors do have a leading edge in like getting the usage out of the armor reduction. Um, but I think for me personally, something like that, yeah, you can say that there's like mathematical like benefits in having certain items on certain classes, but something like Batch of the Swamp God needs smart user and it needs a person who's like on top of trinkets able to use them efficiently and smart on trash packs where it matters the most okay so you think and it's more about the player there then yeah or okay sure sure okay so um i, I guess i right now we, we cover most of the stuff i think i want to talk about I, I have a whole bunch of just more general road questions just stop me when you have to go um and, and yeah. Then, yeah but these are more general road questions that we can cover. Shoot. Um, so, uh, I, well, I guess the first thing I want to talk about uh, AQ is that um, what are your thoughts on Huhurin and Visidus? Do you think all this nature prep is actually even needed? Do you think, uh, are you guys just expecting what a lot of people are expecting where we're just going to go into there, burn them down, and we're not even going to really... Huhurin need... has about like 960k HP according to old uh, vanilla videos, yep. which is about the same HP as Ebon Rock, Flame Go, and Fire Mall. If you can kill one of the bosses, like... Fire more. I mean, people can do fire more in 30 seconds in speedruns uh, if they wreck on that boss. And if you take 100, uh, 100 HP and uh, then divide it in the 30 seconds that you can kill it in, yeah. then the amount of bolt that Huron can manage to get out um, under 30%, because it's like Huron gets to 30%, gets below, and then it's after three seconds that she does the first like AOE, yeah. which I mean, it's it's around 3k damage, and then if you have like a kill time of let's say 30, and then of course it'll be faster in the end. So let's just sit it at like eight seconds. If you have like if you have a kill at 30 seconds, the boss uh, dies faster at the end. To execute like yeah. wreck, which you do at the end. Then you'll have like let's just say seven to ten seconds, which then means that you let's take nine seconds because it's easier with the bolts. You have nine. You minus three because that's when she does the first. Yeah. And then you had six seconds, and then you get two more, uh, like two in total. And that means if you have like a fully world buff raid with melee on like eight, nine, ten k HP, and they pop a greater nature, which is another like two and a half on average. Uh, that means that they can take like twelve and a half k damage before they die, which means that they would have to take like four to five without getting any healing before they die. Yeah. And on top of that, you can also rotate people by who's closest and running back and forth. Yeah. So, okay. so generally yeah. speaking, like I have prepared uh, some stuff, like the most important stuff, like uh, I have some emerald break loot and I have like the calling legs, the Snarian reservist leggings, yeah. I think they're called. Um, but I haven't put out like a full list to, uh, because as I said, I'm, I'm broke CL in my guild and I haven't put out a list where I want them, okay, you need to get all these, these items because I don't think it'll be yeah. that needed. Okay, yes, yeah, so uh, the same same thinking as a lot of guilds then. Um, what about yeah. Visidus with, with like the weapons? Because a lot of people are also expecting that like we are getting like Cold Rage Dagger or whatever to proc the cold hits, but it feels like it's probably not even needed. <laughs> I mean, the faster you can proc like the frozen phase, the faster the boss will die. So in that sense, the more procs you can do, the 
higher like quote unquote DPS you'll have. So if you're interested in doing speed kills, then you'll still be needed and interesting like interested in having those items. Okay. So fair um, okay. Progress. Okay. Um. Yes. Yeah, so, so some general role questions here is um. So what what do you look for when you're optimizing like your own fights or I guess specifically if you were looking to recruit a rogue, what do you look for in dear logs or like in them that makes them kind of stand out from another rogue? Mm, I mean, the most important thing is slice up time. I mean, how much, how many seconds do they have left on slice when the boss dies? Because right now, most people are doing bosses in like 30 to, I don't know, 80 seconds. Yeah. And people have always said like, oh, you need to go for five uh, CP slice. But it's like, if you open with a one or two, giving you like 12 or 15 into a five, then you're already looking at like it's too long, overriding. Yeah. Yeah, overriding the piece. Interesting. It's interesting so it's that you like, said you said slice up time, which most people would assume means like your total uptime, but you're more talking about wasting slice up time at the end of the fight specifically and like optimizing yeah, your rotation. Yeah. There. And then trying to map it out. So I would recommend like using a weak aura, uh, like called time to die. You can find it on Wagyo, where you can see like the estimated time until the boss dies. And then you use slice uh, points depending on how fast the boss will die and of course you'd rather have a few more seconds in the end than too little yeah um and yeah i mean that's that's like definitely the most important thing uh, when it comes to optimizing dps because using fewer points for that means that you can get energy and points out of relentless strikes and ruthlessness faster and that you can because like we've all tried the point where we are at like five CP and we're trying to get an eviscerate in before the boss dies, yeah, yeah. and then we fail to do so. And doing maybe four CP slice, which gives you like effectively another CP for eviscerate, would also make you able to use the eviscerate before the boss dies. Oh, okay. uh, so it's like for instance, I've not done it that precisely for our speedruns, but like for instance, veil. Vale, a lot of guilds can kill that in like one slice. And then I've gone like, oh, right now we're at the point where we kill it between like 16 and 20 seconds. And that means that I don't need four and yeah, five. You don't need extra. Yeah, exactly. So you're talking about to, slice to up the optimization then. Oh, that's yeah. good. Well, at least that, because <laughs> that's what we do a lot of when I do log reviews for people is we look at slice optimizations. But that, that, yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, the other question I have is, um, how do you split your dagger and rogue? rogue um specs up do, do you guys have like say like oh um, we want this many sword rogues this many dagger rogues does, does that matter or do uh, you just let them go it matters for gear distribution and like personal interest so i value like keeping raiders interested for a long time and staying in the guild and then i want them to play what they find the most fun and engaging uh, and then i have a baseline of that and say okay we have like four dagger rogues and, like six sword rogues and for instance when i looked at like loot tables i was like okay Bloodfang is Biss, and that means that you want tier 2 on, like, it's Biss for swords. That means that you want tier 2 on all of the sword rogues, meaning the sword rogues don't need shadow flame boots. So the shadow flame boots will have prior to dagger rogues. And then, depending on, like, how many boots you get, can then make the difference how many people you have go for which spec. Because, as I was talking about before, with, like, optimized deaths increases overall, uh, like, DPS. And that's the same approach I have for items. I would much rather have like mediocre upgrades on everyone the fastest instead of having everyone like just zooming towards some bis list where la they're like, oh, I can go for this suit and then get these five items and then I can get like five more DPS by not using blood thing or whatever. Yeah. Then so, I would much so rather yeah, have like. So you're more looking at like an overall guild picture for you? Yeah, yeah. Because like if you look at all of your rogues and you say like, all of the rogues are doing like, I don't know, 8k DPS. Can you get that to 8.1 by having some people use like less good items and then put the best okay. items on the people who can get the best yeah. uses so out of I, them? Yeah, I guess and that's so interesting. On. So because you're a hardcore guild, you, you look more at like the total guild performance than the individual player as much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like 100% actually. Okay, nice. Well, I mean, I think that's almost everything. I, I guess I did just the one more thing I, I want to uh, end with is, because um, I know you have to go, uh, basically, what would you recommend for, like, if a guild wanted to, like, start out with speedrunning and improving their, their times, um, do you optimize your rogue cooldown usages at all? And, and um, would you put that up there with trash, mm. with uh, trash clearing speed? Or do you kind of just let the rogues do their thing? And... Yes and no. Like, 
I see a, like the classic is that people say like, oh, you need to wait for double crusader to pop your cooldowns. But what I think people then like don't focus as much on is um, looking at how many usages out of adrenaline rush can you get in a 45 minute run. And then sometimes using your adrenaline rush on trash or on a early points and bosses when there's not like all of the debuffs up yet or you don't have double crusader can mean that you can get an extra usage out in the end and i think that's a lot more like lot more important to okay. focus on rather than this again like i don't value peak dps because i value like over time average dps of like all of the all of my rogues in the roster but also in speedruns because it's like it doesn't matter that you got like world first pass on Razor Goal if you end up dying to times, Nova yeah, Acro exactly. or so, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, uh, so do you manage your your rogues, your other rogues cooldowns at all? Do you tell them like, hey, uh, this is where we're gonna use Blade Flurry. This is where we're gonna use Adrenaline Rush. Do you optimize it for them, or do you leave it up to them to figure out? I focus mostly on just like overall guild strategy. And then I have another rogue who tries to look at some stuff like that. But in general, all of the rogues in my roster have like the capability to look at that themselves. And then we have like an open discussion about like, oh, I figured out that if we do it like this, then it works out like that. And then we also try to have like rogue meetings, uh, both as a guild uh, or like class meetings as a guild. And then we also have rogue meetings leading up to speedruns where okay. we so you kind of just work all as a about... team then to, to figure this stuff yeah. out. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, I guess I just just want to end this with, um, uh, if, if you're like a brand new rogue, like let's say you're not experienced anywhere near as experienced as you are where you're getting to a point where you're optimizing your slice and dice timings perfectly for bosses and such. Um, what would yeah. you say is like the key, like the, the top things to work on if they want to get to, to this sort of level? Like where should they start I mean, basically? Of course, keeping keep the, keep the world buffs and then later i would say that it's yeah focusing on like keeping the swing timer running like all the time that's more important than anything else i would say interesting yeah so you're a big swing timer uh, guy then yeah yeah and it's it's the same thing in like molten core for instance so there i would say like you are on a trash pack then yeah you might need to not focus on some elements as much and then you can focus on like having two swing timers like a week or whatever, where you can see that, okay, my swing timer has just landed. If I run over to the new mob now, then I won't have any downtime there and then effectively gain extra. Oh, that's swing. interesting. So you're not only optimizing the swing timer for that bus. You're, you're talking about even optimizing it in between each like like thing that you're killing yeah. as well. So, I mean, you asked about it before when I look at like applicants, for instance. Yeah. There I go to like their raid and then say like, okay, how many auto swings did they get through in the entire run because more often than not that will get like a lot more like PS than anything else and it's the same for sinister strikes like how much energy have you used throughout the instance and people say like oh it caps out at 100 and everyone gains 20 every two seconds but um but it's still like some people they get like fucking 20 or 25 more sinisters than someone else and you can probably check it for your own guild. It's actually insane how much of a difference there can be. And that's really where people... Uh, yeah.